is the Happy Scientist Podcast. Each episode is designed to make you more focused, more productive, and more satisfied in the lab. You can find us online at bitesizebio.com slash happy scientist. Your hosts are Kenneth Vogt, founder of the executive coaching firm Vera Claritas, and Dr. Nick Oswald, PhD, bioscientist, and founder of Bite Size Bio. Hello, this is Nick Oswald welcoming you to this Bite Size Bio webinar, which today is a live episode of the Happy Scientist podcast. If you want to become a happier, healthier and more productive scientist, you're in the right place. With me, as always, is the Bite Size Bio team's Mr. Miyagi, Mr. Kenneth Vogt. In these sessions, we'll hear from Ken mostly on principles that will help shape you for a happier and a more successful career. And along the way, I'll pitch in with points from my personal experience as a scientist and from working with Ken. If you have any questions along the way, put them into the questions box on the side of your screen and I'll put them to Ken. Today, we will be discussing what to do if your love of science is fading. Ken, what's going on with that one? What a, what a somber thought. Your love of science is fading. And yeah, it could be, it could be like falling out of love, you know, just just sad and melancholy, but it also could be a crisis. Like, holy cow, this has been the center of my life since I started to actually have thoughts and all of a sudden it's gone. What am I going to do? Um, yeah, you may lay anywhere on that spectrum. Um, you, you may have all that going on at once and you may have wondered, well, now what? Am, am I supposed to just suffer this? Is everything going to come apart? Are other people going to find out, you know, what is going to happen next if my love of science is starting to fade? So we're going to work through that. We're going to talk about some practical solutions that may that may fix that for you. But we can also we're also going to look at, well, what happens if it's just how it is and it's just not the same for you anymore? So let's dig into that. So. The first question you got to ask yourself about this, and it's a good question to ask about a lot of things. Ask yourself, is it really true? Is it really true? That is a great question for, for inquiry. I mean, from a scientific standpoint, it's a great question. But when it comes to something like this that is more emotional, more psychological, it is also a good question. So... When you ask yourself, is it really true that I don't love science anymore? Um, you, can, you can do some further looking into that. So one of the things you might ask yourself is, well, what used to excite me about it? Why did I used to, to love this? And I'm using the word love here, and I realize that can be a loaded term for some people. But the notion is, what used to engage you about science? What is it about it that really drew you, that really compelled you? They kept you in the game. They kept you going when it was hard. And, and recall those things. It, it may change your present day outlook. Another thing to look at is, are there still things you want to learn? Um, if you feel like, well, you know, I've just got a lock on this and there's nothing new under the sun, you know, and it's not exciting. Yeah, that's, that's not going to ring your chime. But are there still things that are open to you? And chances are there are. I mean, if you really feel like you have totally figured out your zone uh, and there's nothing left, you know, I mean, write the patent office, tell them it's time to close. You know, because it's highly unlikely that that's true, that there's nothing left to learn. The other thing then is well, what kind of future do you envision for you in science and for science in general? How do you see this playing out? Um, when, when you start to realize I could be part of something bigger, I could have an impact, I could make a difference, well, that can reignite your, your desire to keep going. So, you know, give yourself that, these chances to, you know, to personally re-engage, to get your intellect involved again if it's, if it's started to wane and to start projecting forward and seeing where, where does this go next? Now, if you're having 
if you're having feelings like, like it, it just isn't exciting and it's not going to be, I, I was excited for naive reasons for childish reasons in the past. And that's all gone. Well, it's something worth taking note of for you. If you truly feel like there's nothing left to learn you now, that might, that might be not so much. There's no, nothing new to know, but maybe you feel like your environment is keeping you from being able to learn. And then we'll talk about that in a moment. And then of course, if you don't have any excitement about what's coming next, that's that will always stand in your way. And I don't care what part of your life that, that that's involved in. If that's happening where you just see no future whatsoever, um, you definitely need to take a hard look at yourself and see, is that really true? Is that really what's going on here? So moving on, to take this apart, is it might not be that you've lost your love of science. It's that you've encountered the real world. And now you're finding out there are parts of this that you don't like. So it's like, I, I didn't realize how the lab was going to become this machine. And I was just going to be a cog, you know, a cog in the wheel here. Um, and that might have been a bit of wishful thinking, even a bit of naivete. And now you're encountering politics. So like, I didn't know this job was going to involve politics. I didn't know we were going to be fighting over money. Um, I didn't know the people I'd have to work with. I mean, I knew some people in, you know, in the lab and university world, a little hard to deal with. But when I hit the real world, they're really hard to deal with. Okay, well, we do have to toughen up a little bit. And we have to get realistic. And we have to grow up a bit. You know, we can't just fantasize. I'm going to run my own lab. I'm doing all my own things. I'm going to be a mad scientist that's <laughs> going to invent new things. Um, it's, it's enough that you can't be all those things. But there's a context in which that's going to happen. And you have to be, you have to accept that as part of the, part of the game. It's, 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 if all you had was puppy love for science, then it would just be, everything's perfect and it's all great. And it's like, it's like that, that girl in third grade, she's so, she's so pretty and she's so sweet. And now you start to realize she's a human being. She's a person. She's got flaws. She's not always nice. And she, and some days she wears that silly dress that I don't like. And, you know, okay, you start having to change up how you feel about these things. So any of us who've had any kind of relationships, uh, we realize at some point you stop being, you stop being Pollyanna about things. You see, you see them as they really are. And you decide to still love them anyway. And this can happen with a significant other. This can happen with a child. Uh, you know, that, that baby was so cute until they keep me up every single night. You know, uh, science can be the same way. So it's just a matter of just getting a bit more mature about it, recognizing the context that's there, and then realize, okay, these are solvable problems. You know, the machine is the way it is, and I can learn to deal with that. Or I can I can help make the machine better. You, know, you do have that option. Um, politics is, I mean, that's that's going to be true anytime there's people involved. It's it's part of the game. It doesn't have to be an awful game. It doesn't have to be a brutal game. It's just you know every once in a while you realize I got to do a little, I got to flex a little to get what I want. I got to help other people get what they want. That's part of how this works. You know, money is. Money is always a a tough topic for people. I say always. It's often a tough topic for people. But there's a lot of money in science. And you know, you could get your share. <laughs> They'll you know get access to your share. So don't give up on it. Don't just assume that, well, now I gotta compete for that. I didn't see that coming. Well, yeah, but now you see it. So see it and operate accordingly. And you know, other scientists they're not really any better at getting funding than you other than they get, you know, some folks have gotten some experience at it and, and they've bothered to learn how, so you can bother to learn how too. And then as far as people, I mean, people are people, you've been dealing with people your whole life. You can, you can do it. You can manage it. <laughs> so um, another thing you can do 
after you see all those things, all those those barriers and all those extra weights on you that you didn't see coming before. And you can look back and go, okay, wait a minute. What is it that started this all for me? What flipped my switch? What was it that one day I woke up and man, thought, man, I want to do this. This is, this is my fantasy. I want to, I want to play in this, in this pond. You know, I want to, I want to play in this game and, and do this. And you realize I could actually make a living doing this. Somebody will actually pay me. I will. I can have actually have a career doing this thing that I find so fun, so compelling. So you, you got to go back and remember what got you involved in the first place. You know, what what made this so exciting? And then on the flip side, you got to look at okay, what about the real world got in the way? And is it really in the way, or is it just? There's a little bit more to it than I first anticipated. And and that's fine. Don't beat yourself up about that. I mean, how are you supposed to know that when you were sitting there in, in that first chemistry lab in seventh grade? You didn't know where this was all gonna head. You you couldn't you couldn't have imagined it. So don't beat yourself up about the fact that you didn't see this all coming. It it's fine. And people are negotiating it. And People that aren't any smarter than you, aren't any more capable than you, aren't any better connected than you. I mean, you know, everybody has certain advantages, but so do you. You know, the fact is you got this far. You got to have something going on. (laughs) And if, if, you know, if you're a grad student or, you know, you're a PhD, you're a postdoc, I mean, let's face it. You got something going on that most people in the world don't have. And don't forget that. Don't forget that you have passed muster, you have got this far. So just just stick with it. You're already, you're already ninety nine percent of the way there. Another thing you can do, if, even after you've done all this, I looked at what got me here. I looked at what's standing in the way. Like, but I'm still feeling, I'm still feeling wore down, and and I don't like that feeling. Well, look to others who have already passed through this, that have already succeeded. You know. Chances are you have the opportunity to get mentorship from somebody, whether it's in your lab or in your industry, people that you've known in the past, you know, it could be past professors, it could be, it could be people you've met along the way that, that are inspiring to you. Well, look to them, get advice if you can get to them directly. But even if you can't get to them, sometimes you look at, well, there's, I'm never going to get to talk to this person or that person but often they're acting very much in the public. So you could see what they're doing. You can, you can model them. You can emulate what kept them there, what got them there. And if they've managed to stay inspired and stay engaged sometimes for decades, well, you can, you can get engaged too. And it's okay to have low points. You know, we have our ups and downs. We're human. It's totally normal. Just remember that, if you hit a if you hit a valley, that is not how it always must be. Things ebb and flow. So if you just give it a little time, it can pass through that. And you know, you, you can come out the other side. Another thing to remember is you don't even have to look outside. You can look inside. Remember that you yourself have gotten this far in this game. And 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 look back, what worked for me in the past? Well, how did I muscle through in the past? How did I get over past humps? You know, I, what did I do in the past when I plateaued? You may realize, re- realize that when you do that self-examination, you already have the tools to get you past this current one. And you can do what you've done in the past. And if what you did in the past isn't enough, you can take that and use it as a springboard to get you to the next stage. And yeah, sometimes it's going to be harder than the last time. That's fine. You, you've had a whole life of it being harder than the last time and you've gotten through it. So don't cut yourself, you know, don't sell yourself short, um, assuming that I, I don't have any way out of this. I don't know what to do. Like You may find you do. Just sometimes we're running that loop in our head. You know, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And if you stop that for a second, you may realize 
well, actually, I do know what to do. I just don't want to do it. Or I do know what to do and it's going to be hard and I don't like hard, but you know what? I've done hard. I can, I can do hard. I can, I can knuckle, knuckle down and get through it. So again, the self-examination is definitely worth it. <clears throat> so now I'm going to, I'm going to address the elephant in the room. What if it's really true? You know what? This is just not what I thought it would be. I've put in all this effort, all this time. I've got all this sunk cost in this. And I just don't like it. I, I just don't want to do this. I don't want to be this. And so now, now what? Well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of now what? There's a lot of things to do post um, lab-based science. And uh, I will, I will, uh, I will poke at, at Nick about this here in a second, but I just want to tick off a few things that you could do. And then Nick, I'll, uh, I'll draw you in here. I'm taking, you, I'm what's taking, that? I'm taking notes here. <laughs> okay. Well, one thing you can do is you can move up the management. Yeah. Maybe you're not going to work the lab so much anymore, but somebody who understands the lab has to run the lab. So your skills were not wasted. Your, your, Education and knowledge are not lost. It's useful. Perhaps maybe you just need to move out of academia and move into something more commercial. Because there, are, again, the same story. There are plenty of companies out there that very much value the fact that you've that you've gotten the scientific background, and they need somebody with that background to do other parts of the business side of this. And you can move into that business side. They, there are there are definitely need for salespeople that understand science, marketing people that understand science, people that understand the the financial realm, the the funding apparatus that's out there because they've been there and done that. Yep, you know, these are all parts of things that are just valuable commercial skills that you may not even realize you've already gained, and. It will allow you to shift gears and perhaps move into something that you will find a renewed excitement in, but your background is still helpful. Um, journalism. You know, if you look out at science journalism, sometimes it, it, it makes me sad because you wonder what some of these writers are doing. They don't know what they're talking about, but some of them do. And the ones that do really go places and they develop an audience. And that might be very appealing to you. So perhaps journalism is a path to go. We've seen scientists become popular figures in, in, in pop culture. Now, I, I will grant you that there's not a lot of openings there. But there are people that are doing that. They're taking science to the masses. And whether they're doing it on, on talk shows or podcasts or writing books or, or, or other things. Perhaps that is a realm you want to be in. And maybe it's not even your full-time thing. It's something you do on the side, but it makes it, it keeps it exciting for you. And it may be the inoculant that solves the problem for you. And maybe you're still going to stay at that nine to five working in the lab, but it's your side project that keeps you excited. So you can, you can stay engaged in that. And then, of course, the final thing is, you know what? You don't have to stay a scientist. If you decided that that you want to become an artist, you want to become a musician, you want to start a business, you want to do something completely different, you want to get on stage, you can do that. Don't, don't make yourself think that I put in so much effort to get this far in this field that I'm not allowed to set it aside and do something else. You can. If that's really, really what you want, don't let anybody tell you you can't. Keep yourself open to your possibilities. And whether they're within science or outside of science, make yourself a grand success in life. All right, Nick. So now what? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, one thing that I scribbled down there as you were delivering that wisdom, which was lovely. 
uh, is you know, when people say I don't I've fallen out of love with science, what does that mean? What is science? It's just a way of looking at the world. Mm-hmm. When people it's one, you know, science, philosophy, religion, politics, or other other sorts of ways of looking at the world and um trying to figure it out, understand it and make the world a better place. Science is one pie, one chunk in there, and it, and it, used, it uses logic, it uses a specific way of thinking and examining the world and so on, right? And mm-hmm. so when people say, when I say, oh, I, 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 I fell out of love with science, I'm not talking about falling out of love with that way of looking at the world. I'm talking about um, that I realized that I wasn't very good at the green fingers part of science, of the, mm-hmm. technically you know, getting those little bits of liquid into other bits of liquid in the right way and so on. Right? But it didn't mean that I, um, that I wanted to step outside of that macro realm of science. And I did something that you described, which is I, I decided that I wanted to make the machine better. So I did this, and um, which is to support other scientists in being better in their job, right? So that's one very specific example. But... I think it's worth examining, and I think it's just another way of saying what you said. It's worth examining when you say you don't love science, what does that mean? Because there are so many things you can do with a scientific background. It opens so many doors and not just the research pathway. Um, you listed off some you know, marketing sales, the tra- you know, traditional stuff. I, I've seen people that have gone and become independent technical specialists in, in a specific area, helping you know they make their own... Um, you know, become so specialized in one technique and become, you know, the guru or a, a major guru. I've seen people who done that and build their own machines, you know, little in their garage or make a company, to, you know, that build their own equipment and so on. Um, I've seen people going into politics, art, communications, journalism, as you said, even ethics and philosophy and things like that from a scientific background. It's it's about like okay if you don't like the 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 problem and I've discussed this in previous talks the problem <clears throat> when you go into a traditional scientific career you finish your bachelor's you probably do a PhD or something and it's propelling you in a in an expected direction which is towards a PI or maybe going to industry mm-hmm. and that's seen as like generally the two roads but there's so many other things you can do that if you find that those roads are not working for you then you can do it. There's lots of things you could do. That's what I would, one thing to stay open to. Um, and the other thing is, again, as you said, one thing that, that, you know, even if I did find I was quite good at science, one thing I didn't like when I got into the lab, and I think that other people can probably resonate, this will resonate with them, as I didn't like the games that some, the way that some people played the game. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you go back to the, you know, your very beginning, you know, the first few podcasts of this, and we talk about mindsets, or mindsets and stuff like that, you know, there's the orange person who is competitive, and there's the green person who is there, or the blue person who's there for the team, you know, for team science, and there's the people who are competitive uh, mm-hmm. for themselves. And 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 looking back, I saw the people that were, uh, I was put off by looking at the people who were trying to compete for themselves for the sake of winning. And, and that wasn't me. I was there for the, well, let's do team science. Why aren't we collaborating? Right. And, but, but realizing that you don't have to play it the way they're playing it is, is one way to get around that. You know, if you're in there and it's the people, it's the mindsets that are putting you off, it's to realize that you're maybe going to look at back at that. What do you remember? What number of podcasts that is, Ken? Uh, like that, let's see, that would have been, number two or three or something um, like that. that would have been no it would have been four through six i believe uh, four or six so look back in the beginning uh, of our <clears throat> podcast series there's one about core mindsets have a listen to that and it explains different ways of playing the game if you like four five and six were about core mindsets okay it, it explains different ways of playing the game and you might realize that the reason that you're that you're being put off by the people around you in the lab is because they're looking at things with a different mindset to you that they're competing and you're playing team science, for example. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and you, you know, you might try to persuade them to your viewpoint, but chances are they're going to stick with the viewpoint they have. And you got to, you got to toughen up about that. Some people are just going to approach things that way. Some people are going to be very selfish. Some people are going to be very altruistic, even naively. So 
Some people are going to be very practical. You're going to encounter all types and, and you got to learn to deal with it. You got to learn to manage, to interact with people of different styles. And I think that one thing that I didn't appreciate at that time was that to stay in science, I don't have to play the game that way. I can still play it my way. I can stay green or whatever, blue or yeah. green, and do it for te- do it for the team and just and focus on being myself. I don't have to become that person who's hyper competitive and uh, you know and will do anything to win. I don't have to do that. I can still be myself and contribute in my own way. So um, there's an interesting uh, question in from, uh, and by the way, if you have any questions on this or your own comments or experiences, then please put the <clears throat> questions box here. Um, it's from someone called Gleb, who's saying that they're a chemist and always wanted to work in the realm of ideas and achieve that in chemistry. But now they've started to realize that um, things such as wider you know wider lenses then such as or other lenses such as philosophy and art and stuff seem of interest or, or the same or more interested uh, as sciences so chemistry mm-hmm. seems to be narrow and dry and sometimes boring and so and that that's quite an interesting comment actually because that's someone who is obviously curious about the world obviously per, per, pursued chemistry to try and be part of investigating what all of this is and around us and has realized that there's more to it than science and which is quite what would you say about that ken <laughs> well, several things come to mind one is i'm sure all you biologists out there are scared already just saying chemistry oh my god no wonder he's scared he wants to get away from it <laughs> <laughs> chemistry is ex- extremely exciting in its way it and and for the person asking your question, yeah, you you may remember that that it used to be that way for you. You you got that, and it opened up a, a new vista for you. But now you've opened up more vistas. Well, good for you. But you don't have to dislike your past vistas. You you can still find them interesting. But it, it's okay. Go ahead and add more. Do more. You know, a couple of podcasts ago. Uh, I interviewed uh, Dr. Brandon Valle Nathan, who talked that on the topic of beauty in science. It was, it's a be- it's a beautiful idea, and and he's got his own podcast too on this topic that just goes on and on. So I, I would recommend check check out that past episode. Check out Dr. Valle Nathan and see what he has to say about this topic. Because you don't have to say either or. It's not just the logic of chemistry, and it is logical, or the the beauty of philosophy. It's they're not mutually exclusive; they're complementary. So you've added more. So don't don't throw away part of what you already have. You're already you've already got the expertise, and you've already got the you've already gotten deeply engaged in it. Don't don't make that something that is passe now and it's like if uh, if you learn to play you know cricket for instance and then after that you learn to play soccer do you now start to hate cricket because you've learned to play soccer no they're just different they're, they're you know they so so keep them both keep it all going see how this new interest in philosophy can add to your knowledge of chemistry and add to your engagement there. The parts that are you know, you're des- describing as say dry, that's just a that's just a value judgment. It's not necessarily dry. There are plenty of people out there to continue to be very excited about those things that you're writing off as dry. And you can you can do the same yourself. So just recognize you you're passing through a recognition of a new thing. But that that initial recognition with its with its naive fantasy of how much better this is going to be is going to pass. And then you're going to realize, you know, there's there's a drudgery in philosophy that's just like the drudgery back in chemistry. Um, but it's 
it's all just a story that you're telling yourself about it. It doesn't have to be a drudgery just because for a moment it felt that way. You can, you can keep going. You can, you can take it forward. And then, of course, as we were talking about here near at the end, though, if you really have changed your focus, well, maybe a time is time to shift. Maybe you do need to move toward art rather than the hardcore science. You can have that examination without risk. You don't have to quit your job and then figure out what to do next. You know, you can you can spend your time thinking about this, investigating it, looking forward, saying, what do I really want to do? Because the whole point of the this particular podcast, the Happy Scientists, we want you to be happy. And if you can be happy in science, awesome. But if your happiness is going to require you to move on from science, that's okay too. Just just do it with eyes open. Do it with your heart open, and and then you'll you'll make better choices for yourself. What were the two sports you said there? Cricket and what? Soccer. Soccer. All right. So if you're play, you play crick, soccer because you want to experience, you know how you're excited by the game. You're excited by how improving your skill list, skill level and uh, and whatnot. And then you take up cricket. It's just a, it's a, another expression of the same thing, but so is the same. If you then decide to play the piano, right? Mm -hmm. How how yeah. can I? What's my lim what are my limits? How how does this work? And it's the same. I, I think that most people who take up science do it because they're inherently curious, and mm -hmm. it's about um, using this way to explain the world. And I have the same experience. I felt like as soon when I was in undergrad in undergrads, I felt a lot of I felt like my God, okay, this is how this is how proteins are expressed in this, uh, you know, and it all started clicking together. I thought this really explains how the world works to me, evolution and all that. And then I got past it and it was like, well, okay, great. That is one explanation, but there's more to it than that, surely. And so then you can start looking into philosophy or, or whatever else you want to do to follow that same curiosity. Um, whether you do that professionally or not is another matter. But professionally, you know, you don't need to be bound by being a practical bench scientist or even by using your curiosity within the, the wrapper of science. You can, you can, you know, you can go to wherever that curiosity takes you. Right. And, um, you know, again, that, that's why people end up transferring from a small, relatively small number, but Transferring, transferring from science into philosophy, or you know, being a, or ethics, or um, you know, something like that. Polit politics around science, mm -hmm. politics around science, or the the governance of it. You know, what what do what? Where does your curiosity take you, and where does your um, your natural ability take you? That's that's the question, and just. Sure. Um, just see where, just explore. That's what I would say. Um, okay. So yeah, you could satisfy it in simple ways. Like there's a, a YouTube channel I really enjoy that is on food science. Now, I'm not a scientist personally, but I really do like to understand why do we do use this method in cooking? Why do we do things in this order in cooking? And the only reason I care about that is I like to eat. I'm never going to be a professional chef. I'm never going to work in a restaurant. I don't want to, but it doesn't keep me from being curious about it and engaged in it. And I can do that without taking away from what I typically do for a living. And, and there's nothing wrong with what I typically do for a living, but there's no food science in it. And that's not, that is not some aching lack. It's just, of course, it only goes so far. And the whole scientific method only examines that which we can measure. There's plenty of life that cannot be measured. Do we blow that all off? Or if we become aware of it, does that somehow somehow make science less important or less valuable? Or no, it's it's just different and it's fine. You know, go ahead and add more. Uh, it, it just makes things richer. So we have a a, a question. And um, this person is saying that uh, asking 
uh, so they're in the final year of their PhD and the situation is very pressured in terms of sexism, racism in the department and no doubt other sort of uh, academic pressures and so on. Um, they're saying that um, they don't want to be in science anymore because of this. And so how can they survive the final year of their PhD knowing that? Okay, well, first off, I'm gonna question the premise. Do you, do you really think you're gonna to switch to some other area of life where those things will also not be there? This is part of part of the reality of our society. Now, I mean, that could be a hard, hard truth, right? But you don't have to accept it. You don't have to, you know, you could be part of, of the change because because you see it and you feel it so deeply. So the question is, just like you've made this huge commitment to science so far that, you know, you're approaching your doctor, you know, finishing your doctorate, you can make that same kind of commitment to other things too. And maybe you can be part of the force that changes things. Maybe you can be one of the people that stops these things in science. Now, you don't have to change the whole world, but you're already pretty deep in this one world. You can be part of the solution. So use use these kind of experiences as a springboard to take you farther so the question that you got to ask yourself is do i am i really gonna toughen up am i really gonna take on the hard stuff now i'm not saying you have to be martin luther king you know i'm not saying you got to be a martyr for, uh, for the cause here um but can you do your part can you do a part you know when i say your part it's like that's not defined in advance it's like it's not like you have to be Mahatma Gandhi, you know, <laughs> um, you have to be Mother Teresa. No, maybe all you have to do is be a voice of reason. Maybe all you have to do is be the person that says, I have a question. And you don't even have to solve it. You just have to bring it up. And you can watch, you can watch problems being solved. You can, you can be part of the mosaic. So it, it comes down to, to not telling yourself a story, but just see things as they actually are. Some things are bad. Some things are deficient. Some things are, uh, you know, rub you the wrong way. Well, see that because that's always going to be. That's never going to end. That's always going to be a part of life. And the the more you get good at dealing with that kind of contradiction in the world, the more successful you'll be and the happier you'll be. And, and the more you will help others. It's a grand opportunity to be in service to others. Yeah. That's a tough answer, but it's true. And um, the, 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 also the idea of how do I get to the, how do I survive this final year? It's, um, yeah, I've yeah, been I'll let you speak about that. I, I've been there. That you know, if you're in a hard situation, I almost left in the middle of my PhD several times. I'm glad I didn't because I learned stuff about myself. But importantly, I also got a PhD, which opened some doors for me. So um, there's there's motivation in it for yourself in terms of let's just get your head down and focus, get it done to get the the PhD, and then see where you want to go. Um, but also, as Ken said, open yourself up to, okay, do I let these things drive me away or do I stand up? Um, right. and, and what do I learn about myself when I'm doing them? And, and I don't say that lightly because, you know, that sort of, if it's bullying and stuff that's going on, that's, that's not, um, not acceptable. It's not, um, it's not something that, that should be happening. But as Ken says, it can crop up anywhere and, and it needs to be stood, stood up to or questioned, um, that, that's the only way things change over the long run. So that's the kind of wider service if lights are shone on that sort of thing. Sure. And there are things you signed up for, you knew were going to be hard. You knew I'm going to have to take MSG 302. It's just going to be a requirement. And you knew that in advance. But the things that make you the man you will become, the woman you will become, aren't the things you planned for. It's the things that got thrown at you out of the blue. You didn't see coming at all. And you decided, I'm going to deal with this. I'm going to face this. I'm going to pass through this. Those are the things that will make you the person you will become. 
And it's like what Nick was saying a minute ago. You don't know, but that you're really going to give yourself a tool you never knew you were going to need, but you'll have it now and you'll be able, and it'll open doors for you and it'll make things possible and it'll give you more options in the future. So, yeah. you know, don't cut yourself off from that. So on a related note, there's a couple of questions here from uh, our comments, really, um, from Isatu um, saying uh, that they don't like politics and science and the, the politics and science and they think COVID sucked away the life in science. Okay. Um, and in, on one regard, I can see, you know, yeah, the COVID opened, laid bare a lot of things in the world and um, mm -hmm. things don't look the same afterwards. And so, uh, and the same, in a way it's the same as saying, I don't like the politics and science. Without politics, science wouldn't exist because the, the funding wouldn't come through, wouldn't, you know, scrambling for money in society is either about capitalism or politics. And yeah. um, and so the politics has got to be in there with the way society is at the moment. And so um, it's a necessary part of it. So um, how do you deal with it? Do you just walk away from science then? Or do you help to make the political aspect of science better? Or do you, um, do you just carry on regardless, doing your science regardless of the politics and take it as a kind of, uh, as a, you know, a necessary part of life or something like that. There's, there's ways to deal with it, but just because you're, um, I don't know, because your wife snores at night doesn't mean that you have, you know, that you shouldn't stay in the relationship. You know what I mean? There's <laughs> yeah. reasons. And, um, and not all of them are, not all of the, yeah, not, not everything is solvable. I think that's the way I look at it. Yeah, the other thing is, you know, how much will you, Will you put up with before you give up, before you go home, before, you know, you just forget about all the all the positives and all you look at are the negatives. Yep. You know, if if all you're doing is is thinking all day long about I hate this and I and I can't stand that and and it, this should be different. And, you know, when we're doing all of this fantasizing about if only the world looked the way I would have liked it to be. Yeah, look at the world the way it is. And the same, it's just like when you're doing your experiments and you're getting results, you don't blow off the results. You look at that data and then you then you adjust from there. You got to do the same thing when looking at the, the political world. This is how it is. So operate from that point instead of, I wish it weren't like this, because that doesn't get you anywhere. Feels like that was a rather dark episode. <laughs> <laughs> I completely, I totally disagree. I think this is a very positive thing to to drive down to what is really true is as scientific as it gets, folks. You have this, you have a lock in this that is uncommon in the world. Well, make use of it. Don't just use it, you know when you're pipetting liquids into liquids, right? Yeah. <laughs> Use it all the time. It's it's going to make your career better and it's going to make you happier in that career. Yeah. Okay. If there are no more questions or comments, then I think we will... I'm out of stuff. Are you, Ken? Yep, yep. Okay. So we've reached the end of our time today. Thank you, Ken, for some wonderful insight as usual. And to well, you... Thank you, Nick, for the practical insight. <laughs> no worries. And thanks to you, the audience, for listening in, whether that be live today or on demand. If you enjoyed this content, please subscribe to The Happy Scientist on your, fav your favorite podcast platform or on YouTube. Um, you can also listen back to our early episodes that are packed with equally useful wisdom, including those episodes about um, core mindsets that will yes. uh, help you if you haven't read Episodes them. four, five, and six. Okay. And of course, please tell your colleagues about this podcast so we can help spread the happy scientist and make more happy scientists <laughs> um, so and also look out for more happy scientist live episodes in the coming months you can find them listed on events.bitesizebio.com in our newsletters and on the happy scientist facebook page at facebook.com forward slash the happy scientist podcast so until then good luck in your research and good goodbye from all of us at bitesize bio 
including Mr. Miyagi. <laughs> Bye. scientist is brought to you by bite size bio your mentor in the lab bite size bio features thousands of articles and webinars contributed by hundreds of phd scientists and scientific companies who freely offer their hard-won wisdom and solutions to the bite size bio community